and we're going to go over the 70 week prophecy for the first half and then we are going to pray together uh, afterwards so that's usually what we do we have a little bible study and from there we pray together and so we look forward to that uh any news that is happening today and well we've got quite a bit of things happening in the world but we're not worried about those things we are focused on God's holy word and fellowship and prayer because uh, we need Jesus in our lives. Without him, we are absolutely hopeless. And so tonight, uh, we're going to begin uh, with our study called Our Redeemer, the Theme of Prophecy. The Theme of Prophecy. So let's go ahead and pray together before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your faithfulness. We pray tonight that you would speak to our hearts, fill our hearts. Let our hearts burn within us as we open your words and as we learn from the Holy Spirit. Uh, please guide me in this study that we may understand your truth very clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And so usually what I do is I'll just read the question and then the verse comes up and you can read the verse. And that's why we have a mic here. We'll pass it around for you if you'd like to read. You're not forced to, but you'd like to do. So we start with the question number one. What did Jesus show was the theme of the Old Testament prophecy? And the Bible says these words in Luke chapter 24, verse 27. It is kind of small. But, uh, if you can read it. And beginning at Moses and all the prophecies, prophets, he expanded to them in all the scriptures, scriptures the things concerning himself. Thank you, Lucas. For sharing that with us. Prophecy, according to this verse, and according to our study and understanding of it, points us to Jesus. Everything that the Bible prophesies is going to give us a revelation of the character of Jesus Christ. The one important thing about prophecy is it is also an expression of the love of God, because God wants us to know the future so that we don't get derailed and we know what is to come so we can be what? The P word, prepared. He wants us to be prepared. He wants to have preparation. And in order to have preparation, we need to know what's coming. So uh, just like, say, for example, the, the weather man, and if you're living more on the East Coast, you might have tornadoes and storms and things that come in. Uh, cyclones and stuff, but sometimes they'll warn you so that you can tape up your windows, that you can get in the basement, you can protect your family, get everyone ready, go to a shelter, whatever it might be, because you know it's coming. And that's kind of what prophecy is. It's a warning call to the world, to God's people that, hey, this is coming. Therefore, prepare. Get yourself ready because it's coming. Tape up your windows, so to speak. Go to the shelter, so to speak. Store up the food. And for us, it would be the word of God, storing the treasures of God's word. These are the things we need to do to prepare for the coming storm. Uh, and the prophecy, of course, of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD um, 70, not one Christian perished in that siege from Titus because they heeded the warning of Christ, right? And... Of course, they prayed that their flight was not on the, on, in the winter or the Sabbath day as well. But God answered that. Question number two. What city did the Old Testament say Jesus was to be born? According to the Old Testament, next, the verse, is Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Ephrathah? Though you were little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, of old, from everlasting. So the Old Testament does prophesy where 
Jesus, the Messiah, would be born. In Micah, it says, O little town of Bethlehem. All right, so that's the town. And what does Bethlehem mean? House of bread, right? I wonder bread. how ironic that is. Is that ironic or is that just um, coincidental or is that meant to be? Yeah. Why would it be house of bread? Because Jesus is the bread of life and he came out of Bethlehem. Actually, from my understanding, in, in uh, history, it talks about Bethlehem being uh, the place where you would get good baked goods. That's where you went. You went to Bethlehem to find the best bread in town. Like uh, for us, we go to Boudin or whatever it might be. We go and we find that great delicious bread, right, that, that, that we go to. But Bethlehem was the place to go for bread. But Bethlehem is also where Jesus was born, and he is the bread of life. He, Of course, uh, he refers to himself as the manna that came down from heaven, the bread that came down from heaven that nourishes our spiritual soul. All right, let's um, go on to question number three. Was there also a specific time when Jesus was to appear, according to Scripture? Oh, you, you do have to. It's on. It's number. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So what's interesting is when you look at the scripture referring to the coming of Jesus, you're going to see this recurring word time. In this case, it says, but when the fullness of time had come. So. God has a timetable set. And every time you're going to be reading, we're going to be reading more verses here about Jesus even saying, uh, you know, the time is fulfilled and all this kind of about the time. So what is he talking about? Is it just, oh, random time or this is the time where I'm here? No, he's referring to the prophecies that point to him and to his sacrifice for the redemption of mankind. So uh, when we read about time and when God, Jesus talks about time, he is referring specifically to the fulfillment of prophecy because prophecy is on a timetable. We know the 2300-year prophecy. We know in Daniel, and we know also the 70-week prophecy. That's the one we're going to be studying tonight. All right, so Galatians 4, 4, that's very clear. Question number four, when was that time to be, according to Scripture? Daniel 9, 24 through 25. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. So here we have prophecy. We have a prophecy that is so beautiful when you understand it correctly. And of course, we're talking about when was that time to be? Well, it says 69 weeks after the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. So when was that? That would be in 457 B.C. That's when the decree went forth. And so from that point on, you count um, 69 weeks or how many days? We're going to look at that in just a, a moment in our next, um, in our next uh, question. But remember, 69 weeks after the command to restore and to build Jerusalem would be until Messiah the Prince. Or it would be when the Messiah would actually 
the anointed, which, of course, Messiah means anointed. That's why it refers to that. Or in the Greek, Christ means anointed. So you have Messiah in the Old Testament that re re uh, referring to the anointed one. And then you have Christ, which is in the Greek in the New Testament, where it means also anointed one. Okay? So let's go to the next question. It's going to always point to Jesus, right? 69 weeks is 483 days. In symbolic prophecy, what does a day represent? This is one thing I love about the Seventh-day Adventist Church and how biblically literate we are, right? I think it's, it's getting, you see, it's echoing over here. Um, and, and that is, what does a day represent in the context of prophecy? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Ezekiel 4, 6, and, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall hear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. All right, so there you go. I think it has to be, just make sure I'm, my, my levels are good on Zoom, because it's pretty low now. All right, perfect. So um, I just want to make sure everyone on Zoom is, is, is also following along. Uh, so in this case here in Ezekiel, God says, according to this prophecy where he was to lay on his side, he says 40 days, and then he says each day is reckoned as a year. And that's kind of where we get this idea of how to interpret these time prophecies because um, it, it, a lot of times it didn't make sense when William Miller was studying the 2300 days um, it didn't really make sense to him until he came to this passage right here and until he discovered that in time, in, in prophecy, when it comes to time, a day equals a literal year, okay? And so everything started to come together in the prophecies at that point for William Miller. And that's pretty much how we came up with all of our wonderful truths in prophecy. Question uh, number six, 6A. Six 69 weeks ended in Tiberius Caesar's 15th year. What happened that year? Ezekiel 4, 6. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Luke, it's sorry. Luke 3, 1 to 3. I, I messed up there. It's a typo. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the, remi the repentance for the remission of sins. Okay. Luke 3, 1 through 3. Okay, next. There you go. Continue to read. Luke 3, 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my be my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. What we want to look at here is the Holy Spirit. And how did the Holy Spirit come down upon Jesus in the form of? In the form of a dove. Dove is a symbol of peace. But also, dove is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so we have Jesus being baptized. And of course, this is right at the end of the 69 weeks in, t in the reign of Tiberius Caesar and his 15th year reign. That is exactly when Jesus was baptized. Or we could say he was anointed. Okay? That's why in... The book of Daniel, when it talks about this prophecy, and it says uh, that uh, the Messiah, the prince, would come at the end of the 69 weeks, Messiah is the anointed one, and here at his baptism, right at that specific time, in the 15th year of Tiberius, is when Jesus himself was anointed or baptized. He 
was revealed to the whole entire world at that point as Messiah because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's continue. Messiah means anointed. When and how was Jesus anointed? Acts 10, 37, and 38. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So we know where Jesus was anointed because the Bible refers to it. It speaks to it. Jesus was anointed where? At his baptism. How do we know that? Because it begins with what? Who? Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So you have John here and Jesus. And that's, of course, where we understand um, the whole, you know, meeting between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And there, Jesus, when he was baptized in the River Jordan, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's go to question number eight. Did Jesus recognize the fulfillment of this prophetic time? This is exciting here because this is what Jesus says himself. This is These are Jesus' words right here. Okay. Okay. What does Jesus say? Saying the time is fulfilled and kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. Reply, repent, and believe. Yes, believe in the gospel. Sometimes we look at this verse and we don't even realize that when Jesus says that time is fulfilled, that he's referring to the 69 weeks in Daniel, right? But he is. He knows, right? He knows that he's a part of this prophetic timetable, and he's fulfilling what the Old Testament scriptures were saying. And Jesus was very wise, and he, he came to this understanding as he studied the Old Testament scriptures, right? Uh, he began to realize that he has something very important to do for the human race, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John the Baptist really affirmed what Jesus already knew in his heart at that time, that he was that lamb, right? Because John the Baptist pointed and said, Behold, who? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus must have been like, Hey, John the Baptist, you're pretty smart. Now you study the prophecies too, right? You know where I'm here. You know what I'm here to do. Um, and that must have been an amazing meeting. How many of you would have loved to just be there on the side of the River Jordan that day to watch and witness this whole thing happening. It would have been something special. Amen. Question number nine. The Jews wanted Messiah to be an earthly monarch, but what was the main or the real purpose for Jesus' first coming? Daniel 9.26 says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. Okay, and let, read the next one as well, I believe. It's... Oh, no, go back. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so he shall be cut off. cut off. After the 62 weeks shall Messiah the Prince be cut off, but not for himself. What does that mean? After the 69 weeks. So 69 weeks, of course, Jesus is anointed. He's baptized. He goes into his public ministry. But it says here that after uh, the sixty, uh, after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Right? Um, this is talking about this. It is. <clears> 
<clears throat> You're absolutely right. And um, <laughs> it's uh, 69 weeks or 483 years, and then it's the middle of the seventh week, 70th week. So that's a typo, sorry. Okay, so um, this means, I mean, this is not a typo. After the 62 weeks, Messiah the Prince shall be cut off, but not for himself. Um, no, that is that is right. Okay, let's let's look at the next, the next. Um, we'll look at a graph in a little bit, okay? Jesus' baptism marked the end of the 69 weeks and the beginning of the 70th week of probationary time allotted to the Jewish nation. What would happen in the middle of this prophetic week? So you have 69 weeks, correct? At the end of the 69 weeks, Jesus is baptized. He goes into his public ministry, and it says in the middle of the 70th week, he's cut off. Okay? But it says here, what would happen in the middle of this prophetic week? Daniel 9, 27a. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. Yeah. So it very it makes a lot of sense now, right? You're getting it because 69 weeks, 483 years to his anointing or his baptism, the beginning of his public ministry. And then there's there's a one more week left, right? Because it's only 69. But the prophecy is 70 weeks. Yeah, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. <laughs> okay, um, so let's focus here on the final week, right? And in the middle of that final week, three and a half years, right? Messiah would be cut off and put an end to sacrifice. Now, it means that, uh, you know, at the end of the sacrificial system. And we witnessed what happened in the temple when Jesus died on the cross. Something happened. The knife fell out of the priest's hand and what happened in, with the veil? It was torn from top to bottom, right? Signifying a divine hand that came and tore the veil in half, in two, symbolizing that it is the end of the sacrificial system. So that's why we don't slay rams and lambs today. Many of them continued, of course. Yeah, they continued to do the same thing. Mm, no. They don't, and I don't know why, but um, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure about that. I have to study that. <laughs> You're answer, asking some good questions. Okay, did Jesus understand the prophetic time period pointed forward to his being cut off and doing away with sacrifices? Luke nine fifty one. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay. So it says again, when the what? Time had come for him to be been received up. What does that mean, received up? Well, so I, I'm guessing that that means that he would be taken back to heaven or um, crucified. Crucified. Yeah. But, well, it, it would mean that he, he, would, he would. It had come for him to be received up. Received up, meaning crucified, okay. pretty much, is what it's pointing to. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, and focus on time here. When the time had come for him to be received up, crucified, he would be killed for our sins, right? And what did Jesus say on the cross about time? It is finished. What was he referring to? The prophecy was continuing. The prophecy was, was, was being fulfilled, right? Because in the middle of the final week, Messiah would be cut off. And therefore, Jesus declaring, it is finished. I have fulfilled my part of this time prophecy, right? And of course, it is finished in that um, I've brought redemption to the human race, right? That's the main thing. But it also includes the time prophecy. Question number 12. Since after Jesus' death, there were still three and a half years of the final 70th week, right? Because in the middle, he was cut off, but there's still three and a half more years left, 
right? Okay. Um, to finish the 70th week for special ministry to the Jewish people, where did Jesus tell his disciples to begin their witness? Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Yes. So the, the message is to go to the Gentiles now. The other nations, right? Um, and of course, we know what happened. Uh, <laughs> we know what happened with Stephen. I believe are we going to be talking about the Steve, Stephen here? Because um, if not, I want to talk about it. Okay, so at the stoning of Stephen, that was pretty much the final plea for God the final opportunity God was giving the Jewish nation to remain faithful and to turn to him and to be loyal to God. But um, when Stephen was stoned, that pretty much marked the end of the Jewish nation as being God's special people that he would you know, honor just that race. Um, and, and so from that point on, in fact, it's interesting that the one who pretty much ended the time prophecy was the 70 week was Paul or Saul at that point because he had Stephen stoned, right? <laughs> but then yet Paul is the one who actually carries the message to the Gentile world in such an, a mighty way and a mighty force. And that's kind of a quite a, a meeting that's going to be had in heaven where you know, Stephen sees Paul there. The last thing Stephen saw was Paul pointing to him, kill him right now, right? And then in heaven, he's going to be, Paul, hey, what's going on? How'd you get here? <laughs> you were about, you were, last thing I remember is you, you had me executed. So <laughs> that'll be an interesting meeting, won't it? All right. So uh, question number 13, when did the gospel begin to go to the Gentiles? Oh, yeah, it, it, it is here. I forgot. So Acts 7.59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling out on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Okay, so that's it. And then 15b. Acts 8.1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Acts 8, 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the, the word. All right. So now you see the, the, the gospel being proclaimed to the Gentile world. And um, what can we see? That's right. Um, what what God gives to if God gives to a, a a group of people precious truth, He doesn't give it to for them to just selfishly hoard it and feel special because now we have the truth. He gives us truth so we can be depositories of that truth to the world. And so the beautiful message that Adventists have, um, you know, we ought to be sharing that like with trumpet sound to the whole world. We've got a message that can free people from depression, from fear, from anxiety of what's to come. Why? Because we have the clearest grasp on prophecy and what is to come. And, and so we don't have to question what's going to happen. We don't, when we look at the news and stuff, we, we just go, well, fulfillment of prophecy. That's the Adventist, right, the response. It's not like, oh, oh I don't know, Jesus, what's going to happen to me tomorrow? The, the world's going to crush me. I'm not going to, you know, all these fears that enter our mind. You know, that's the beauty, beautiful thing about the gift of prophecy. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, of course, you know, some people focus on that way too much. But, but we have to. We have to focus on it, especially now. Why? Because this is the message, the three angels' message that is to go to every corner of the world. Because this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. How many of you want Jesus to come already? I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
And so I want other people to be also realize that they can experience the joy of what is to come because God loves them and he gave his life for them. Question number 14, last question. Was the Jewish nation still God's chosen people after 34 AD, which is, of course, the end of the 70-week prophecy? Romans 2, 28 through 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So who is Israel now? We are spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews, according to what Paul is saying. And of course, the Bible says, if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you and I are Abraham's seed because we are Christ, and we are children who have the inheritance and of the promise, of course, as well. And then here's a graph here just to kind of sum things up so we don't get too confused. Let's go to the next, uh, the last slide, and it should show the graph. Oh, it froze. Oh, no. Okay. So just to... Um, to go over it one more time, just to briefly go over it, if you can picture this, 457 B.C. is when the decree went forth to restore and to build Jerusalem, right? And then you would count 69 weeks, which would bring us to 27 A.D. Now, um, the 62 weeks uh, was what started in 408 B.C. That was the rebuilding of the wall in troublous times. Okay, so there, there's two beginnings. One is 457 BC, which is decreed to restore and build Jerusalem. But then 408, of course, was when the wall would be um, um, finished. And at that point, I believe, this is what I'm understanding, at 408 BC is when that happened. And from 408 BC is 62 weeks to AD 27 where Jesus was then baptized, or Messiah would come into the picture. Now, of course, in 27 AD um, is really the end of the 60. Voting week, now we have to account for. Well, the beginning of that week is the baptism of Jesus. The middle of that week, three and a half years, because, you know, each day is a year. So we're talking about seven years. In the middle of the week, which is three and a half years, Jesus would be cut off, but not for himself because Jesus didn't sin. He died not for himself. He died for you and me, right? He had no sin. Oh, there it is. And, and so therefore, middle of the week, eighty thirty one, Jesus was crucified. And then three and a half years later to fulfill the week, right at the end of the 70-week prophecy, Stephen was stoned. And the message then went to the Gentile world. So this is very clear. All the prophecies line up. It makes sense. And that should give us encouragement. That God knows the future. And he has revealed everything we need to know. Not only we need to know prophetically, but God has shown us, God has given us all the understanding that we need to experience salvation. And that's probably the most important thing to God is that every one of us is saved in the kingdom of heaven. So all of you out there in Zoom land, um, we are thankful that we were able to study together. If you have more questions, please um, type them into the Zoom. We'll try to answer those. But enjoy your prayer session tonight there on Zoom. God bless you, and we will enjoy ours here as well. See you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.